Welcome to the Metacast Crypto Corner, brought to you by Novik. I'm your host, Nick Ovori. Today, we ask the question, when Metaverse? There is a ton of hype around the notion of the Metaverse. Uh, there's no shortage of companies trying to build it. We have lots of operations like legacy folks like Second Life. They've been around for years trying to do this. Uh, we have huge tech giants like Meta trying to brute force essentially their way into a Metaverse play by spending billions on it every quarter. Uh, we have medium-sized players, large players, depending on how you look at it, uh, that target particular consumer segments like Roblox does with, with kids uh, and young adults. And then we've got newer startups like Decentraland, The Sandbox, and a whole bunch of others that are building on blockchain, embracing Web3, and making that the, the Metaverse pillar that they're focused on. But what really is the Metaverse? What does it even mean? And many of us by now know that the term itself, Metaverse, was coined by Neil Stevenson in his 1992 science fiction novel, Snow Crash, uh, which envisions a virtual reality-based successor to the internet. And you know, people are using digital avatars of themselves to explore this online world, which is often uh, uh, very dystopian, or the real version of it at least is. But since then, the term has come to mean lots of different things to lots of different people. And so to unpack what the metaverse really means, um, or what we think it means, um, and where we are in this hype cycle for the metaverse, uh, we have one of the best thinkers, writers, podcasters, and operators on the subject, and that is Jonathan Ras Friedman. Uh, he is the founder and CEO of Super Social, which develops content and games for the metaverse. Uh, he's also the creator of Into the Metaverse, which is a Substack newsletter and a podcast, uh, which, surprise, surprise, covers the metaverse in pretty much uh, as much depth as you could possibly want. So I can think of no better guest than Jan to answer the question, when metaverse? So Jan, without further ado, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Nico, and I appreciate the kind introduction. Awesome, awesome. Well, we're going to dive right in here. Um, and we're going to get to, to uh, the first question, which is, tell me about it yourself. You know, what does uh, Super Social do? What was your journey into building for the metaverse look like? Um, and where do you see it going from here? You know, what gets you excited and out of bed in the mornings? So, you know, my journey actually started, I, I would say, observing the category already in 2012 when I started my first company, Kana Computing, which was a computer kids can build and code themselves. And because I was building a consumer product for essentially that audience, right, anyone below age 18, I became quite familiar with all the other platforms and software services and applications that existed anywhere from games like Clash of Clans to these new entrants that took over the world by surprise, especially Minecraft in 2012, 2013 exploded. And then later on, Roblox really started to pick up in 2015, even though it was founded in 2007. And so over the last 10, 12 years, I've seen, I had a first kind of first row seat at looking at the category evolving from something that either very much gamers have played with, if it's World of Warcraft and games like that, or kids in platforms like Roblox, Minecraft, and even before that, Club Penguin, which everyone oh, yeah. you know, kind of forgot about, right? Uh, no, don't forget about Club Penguin. Don't don't and, fade Club Penguin. That was amazing. Uh, yeah, exactly. Was, and and that was probably like the first sort of you know three D kind of social network for yeah. kids, which explains why Disney you know bought it and then obviously in a Disney fashion did nothing with it. Um, and so I had a front row seat over the last decade into the category of virtual worlds, and when COVID accelerated. Uh, COVID arrived in you know early 2020, all of these dots, all of the things that I've done in the prior 10 years while also being a gamer and seeing the category evolving and also realizing that those kids from 10 years ago, those 10-year-old kids who were playing are actually now creating worlds and content on these same platforms like Roblox, like Minecraft, and you know later on also Fortnite Creative Mode emerged as, as another frontier. So it, it sort of was very abundantly clear to me that virtual worlds are going to be so much more than just games. They're going to be almost like the next modality of the internet after websites, after iPhone apps. Not that these are going away, but virtual world in 3D could potentially become the main user interface, the main user experience of the consumer internet and the enterprise internet in the next decade. And I decided early in 2020 to make a bet and start by building a metaverse company that would develop, publish, and operate these iconic virtual worlds by initially starting on the Roblox platform. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons why we started on the Roblox platform, but that was sort of the hypothesis and why we started the company. And what gets me excited is two things. 
helping to imagine what virtual worlds actually mean for the future of the internet. What are those experiences that we can build with original IP, with brands, with IP owners, with enterprises? What are those worlds can be? And how do we build meaningful experiences for a new generation of consumers? And then the second thing is building an organization that is powered by both people with experience, but also the new creator generation, people who grew up on these platforms and building an organization and a DNA that bring these two things together to create those iconic experiences. So that's an amazing intro answer. Uh, there is so much to unpack there. Um, you know, I've scribbled notes here around all the things you said, which are all amazing, but all of them you know, I'm not saying they're buzzwords because they're real. And I know that these are, these are things that, um, uh, you know, we can latch on to, but there's a lot to unpack. Right. Uh, and so maybe the first thing, first things first, I mean, you mentioned things like virtual world, it's the next modality of the internet. It's the main user interface into the consumer internet. Um, you know, those are, those sound big, big ideas. Let's see what actually lies beneath. So, um, you know, in my intro, I mentioned that the, the term metaverse was actually coined by Neil Stevenson. I think mo most of us know that by now, 1992. So not, not that long ago, fairly recently. Um, and, you know, most recently, it's probably been popularized by um, Ernest Klein's novel, Ready Player One, and of course, the movies that Steven Spielberg made. The novel was amazing. Uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. The movie, not so much. Uh, my, my personal view, <laughs> I'm sure many people liked it. Um, but I think a lot of people have taken a view of like, oh, the metaverse is this thing where you put it on your head. It's a headset. It's a VR world. And you go and you escape the real world and you go into this virtual world and you do it through a piece of hardware and then some combination of software. Um, is that the right way to think about it? And, you know, what is your thought on the idea that we need a piece of hardware that we put on our heads and we exist in this virtual world? Um, is that the right way to think about the metaverse? What is your definition of the metaverse? So I, I would first say what I believe is critical for a metaverse to emerge. And then maybe actually, let me say what, what, what I believe the metaverse is ultimately could be. And we're very, very far from that. And then I think, what, what are some of the critical components? I'll, I'll probably piggyback on some definitions by folks that, that, that I appreciate their opinion and thought leadership as well, like, you know, Matthew Ball, for example, but also, you know, Dave Bazuki, Team Sweeney from, from, from Epic, you know, people who have, a, like Team and, and Dave that have actually been building stuff for the past 15, 20, 25 years. When we just uh, thought that reading the book is sufficient, they actually built companies and built game engines and platform that are now so important on the internet. In my mind, looking at all of these thought leaders, I would define the metaverse, in, in my opinion, as a network of virtual worlds that are interoperable, that are synchronous, that are persistent, where people can also carry their digital assets and identities with them from one place to another. And in many of those things, these virtual worlds can be about games, can be about entertainment experiences, can be a lot of different things, most of which do not even exist yet necessarily, which is why this space is so exciting. Now, this may, not, may or may not actually happen. Right? Because when we talk about these other buzzwords that I just mentioned, like interoperability, like persistency, like synchronous, there needs to be a whole new protocol layer and internet built on the existing internet to actually enable real-time interoperability where you and I can actually jump from one virtual world in 3D to another virtual world in 3D, and they're collaborative and they're open, and I can we can carry our assets. We, I mean, these are really, really, really big fundamental things that needs to be built, enabled, collaborated by companies. And it may or may not happen. No one knows. Is blockchain relevant? Unclear yet, right? However, I actually think that for a true metaverse, which in my mind is the not only a gateway into a persistent, synchronous, expansive, hyper-social virtual world in 3D to emerge, I think there's another really important component that very few people talk about, and it's called real life. Mm -hmm. I actually think that there's not going to be a metaverse that is meaningful without the connection between real and unreal. Because I think if all we do ultimately is build a virtual, a network of virtual world that are isolated from real life, we will end up with something that is quite dystopian, where people need to run away to virtual worlds mm. from reality. And I think we're going to miss on a really incredible opportunity of 
not only how do we access these virtual worlds, these network of virtual worlds, but also how that content, those identities, those digital assets interact and amplify our existence as actual real humans. And this is my issue. Well, not an issue. This is kind of the other thing of getting excited about these dystopian stories like Snow Crash, Ready Player One, which are actually great stories and they do portray, in my mind, a danger of what the world could look like. I mean, if we end up really in 2049, and I live in Columbus, Ohio, where Ready Player One happens, right? If we end up waking up in 2049 and the world looks like it looks like in Ready Player One, I mean, God help us all. That's not a reality we want to actually live in. We don't want to live in a world where 24-7, we would just want to run away and have a headset on our head. So I think the connection to a positive world is going to be really important to create a meaningful metaverse, in my mind, that connects the real and the unreal to create one symbiotic experience for people with virtual content, with virtual experiences that amplify and is amplified by real life. So that's one thing that I think is really important to call out. The other thing is that when we think about these virtual worlds, at the moment, we really need to unpack what it actually means. And today, to a large extent, they all feel very much like a video game. And you know what? That's okay. I'm literally not worried yet. Are we really going to get to that metaverse? Let's get there as fast as we can. I'm quite deterministic that I think some of that bigger vision of what the metaverse could be ultimately will happen. Could take five years, 10 years, 20 years. What we do have at the moment is metaverse type platforms that in and of themselves potentially enable interoperability, carrying your identity and assets. And and if you look at platform like Roblox, for example, you're starting to see that some of those principles that we've outlined about quote unquote metaverse already exist to some extent in these prototype platforms. Now, these prototype platforms are not going to be the all-encompassing internet, just like Facebook and Google are not the internet. They are applications that run on the World Wide Web. I do envision that the V1 of the metaverse, in my mind, will be this collection of platforms that are not necessarily interoperable between themselves, but among them, inside them, we do enable some metaverse experience and metaverse interaction. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the best and the closest we get to a metaverse within those isolated realms. And then, you know, 10, 15, 20 years from now, let's see if those things interact with one another. Well, so much more to unpack there. Um, I'm going to focus on one thing um, because, you know, interoperability has been one of these big buzzwords. Um, you know, we, we talk about the notion of there's one metaverse to rule them all, you know, of course, and a Ready Player One, that's that's what it was. There was one metaverse that, you know, literally did rule them all. I'm sure, you know, Mark Zuckerberg would be very happy if the, the meta vision for whatever the metaverse is going to be is the one to rule them all, just like, you know, Facebook is the social network to rule them all, essentially. Um, but I think one of the things you said uh, that I'm going to latch onto here is we need collaboration uh, and we need a protocol layer approach to actually making sure that the stuff is interoperable. And I, I couldn't agree more with you, by the way. Um, you know, right now it's very disparate. Everyone's rushing. It's a, it's a land grab. It's a gold rush. Um, and, you know, a lot of companies are raising a lot of money or spending a lot of money or both um, to try and build their version of the metaverse. And of course, as of right now, none of those are interoperable. They're, they really aren't. There's no way to take your Roblox assets into the sandbox and vice versa, right? Like it really isn't. Even if there's like a intention like, oh, we'd like for that to be a thing. So talk to me about this protocol layer piece. I think that's super critical because without that collaboration between all the different players who are actually looking to build this and for there to be some understanding, just like the internet, you know, when the internet first came to be, it could have been a series of mini internets that were all corporate owned or university owned. And it was only because the, the open protocols uh, enabled this singular vision of the internet to come to being that it came to being. Uh, there was altruism. There was, uh, you know, a lack of profit motive. Uh, like these are all things that are very rare in human existence. <laughs> and so how do we get to a, you know, a singular version of the metaverse? And, and by singular, I don't mean that there's just one of them, like there is a Ready Player One, but a version of the metaverse where you actually can take your assets from one world to another and you can actually interact from one place to another. And it's not a series of walled gardens. Uh, talk to me about the protocol layer as you see it. I mean, that's the gazillion dollar question, right? Uh, mm. How does that happen? I do want to say on a side note that in the early days of the internet, there were companies that tried mm. to, I, to create a mini internet, AOL, 
yeah. tried to create exactly that, which is exactly why they failed, because it was right. impossible. You cannot contain the power of the internet in one website. And, and they learned it, and ultimately they failed. And today they're worth you know, a fraction of a fraction of what AOL was worth in the early 2000s or the end of the, the previous millennia. And so I think what's happening now is very much an example of what happened back in the day. The difference is that we're talking about things that are way, way more complex, in orders of magnitude more complex, because you're talking about a 3D internet that at the moment, the World Wide Web is not designed for that type of scale, not the world's, the amount of data, the, 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 the bandwidth that we need in order to enable 3D interaction in real time across multiple devices all over the world. I mean, we're really talking about a whole new infrastructure that needs to be built, but let's put that aside for a sec. On the interoperability, it's not just about, it's not just about how do we enable the end user to move things around. I actually think the interoperability starts with the development and the creation side of things. And so when we think about the way you build on Roblox today, there is a Roblox engine, it's called Studio, and there is Roblox protocols, and there is an infrastructure that is very much closed within the Roblox ecosystem. And Roblox doesn't play with other pieces. Fortnite Creative has their own environment. It's built on a different engine. They're actually integrating the Unreal Engine sometime in the next year into Fortnite Creative. Minecraft is a whole different thing, let alone Decentraland and Sandbox. And so I think the question starts with, how do we make sure that that infrastructure of development and creation in and of itself is actually interoperable? Because I think if we get the infrastructure level to be open, collaborative, example of that would be what NVIDIA is trying to do with the Omniverse, right? They're, they're mm. integrating a bunch of different tools, Blender, Maya, Unreal Engine. You, like, there is a bunch of set of tools that the Omniverse allows you to integrate because NVIDIA is not trying to be a platform. They're trying to be an enabler as long as, of course, you use their incredible computational application. Um, but nonetheless, companies like NVIDIA, I think, are at the forefront of trying to enable that sort of open protocols. Um, and so I think for me, it starts with the creation and development and making sure that the assets I'm creating on Roblox, let's say, I can actually use those assets in a different platform. If we don't have that collaborative environment of development, it's going to be even harder and even more complex to enable the users to take something with them because what are they taking with them, Nico? They're taking mm -hmm. assets. What are their assets? They're files. What is the format of those files? Well, let's go back to how they were created. So when we talk about interoperability and enabling this open metaverse that a lot of people dream about, we are going to fundamentally need all these amazing companies, NVIDIA, Unity, Roblox, Apple, Google. I mean, we're not even starting to talk about those companies. Facebook to really want to enable this shared ecosystem, just like the World Wide Web was built. I don't know how realistic that, <laughs> you know, mm. for that to happen, because you're not talking about a bunch of small little startups. Yes, let's collaborate. One plus one equals five. You're talking about some, some big, massive companies, each of whom is investing hundreds and billions of dollars every year in developing their own ecosystem. And so, I don't have a good answer of what needs to be in place of side of these companies will just have to uh, collaborate and, and enable those shared ecosystems. However, just like what I said about AOL and the internet, I do believe, and this is an hypothesis, I do believe that companies and platforms that will not make steps to be more open and collaborative ultimately will not be the winners of the category. That's just based on history. Closed platforms do not win. I mean, let's see what happens with Apple. We're seeing now in Europe how they are now being forced to allow app stores within their ecosystem. I think that trend is pretty clear that the world regulators are going to put a lot of pressure on platform to be more competitive and to enable competition. And I think Roblox is just too small at the moment to be in the conversation. Mm. But as virtual worlds over the next five to 10 years become more a bigger fundamental role in the internet, and I think that's the time scale I'm looking at, five to 10 years, probably you and I can have a more comprehensive conversation, I would say, in 2028, 29, 30, 2030 on, okay, now what we do, are we in the right trajectory of enabling an open metaverse? Because I think the next three to seven years, are still going, companies are going to be obsessively focused on themselves while they talk to talk about open metaverse. Mm -hmm. So I have a, two questions here. The first one may be a, a quick one. Um, 
Will this metaverse or this vision of the metaverse that you and I probably both share, which is this you know open world where sure there's like different worlds you can pass through, but you can take your assets, you can go from one to the other. W- will that vision have failed if these companies do not collaborate? If, if we do not see that vision of this protocol layer happening over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, wh- whatever number of years it is, um, will it have failed? Or well, is it still possible to have a satisfying, satisfactory, um, holistic metaverse or series of metaverses if that doesn't happen? You know, one of my favorite equations in life is uh, dream minus reality equals uh, happiness. Mm-hmm. So the dream is completely open, interoperable meta- internet in 3D where we jump around and carrying our identity and, and there is one big thriving virtual economy. That's a dream. Mm-hmm. Now, although I'm a dreamer, I'm also a relatively pragmatic entrepreneur. I, I don't see how that happens in the next 10, 15, 20 years. I, I just think there's just too many complexities of how this just happens overnight. I think in 15, 20 years, maybe it's more realistic. I think what we're going to have until then, and maybe for a very long time, is a collection of essentially of, of websites and platforms that represent the ideal of a metaverse within their little enclave. And I think there are going to be probably three major platforms in the Western worlds. I think I exclude China because they have their own, they have their own worlds. Um, and I think in the Western world, you, we will have three to five, just like we had three to five big social media companies. And I think those three to five companies, potentially each of them will have certain metaverse-like identity and infrastructure that enables what we just talked about, interoperability, carrying your identity, and so on and so forth, within their world garden. That is what I expect for the V1 of the metaverse to become. And I think that will persist for, I, I mean, I'm not, I, I don't want to predict, but, but I think it will persist for at least one or two decades. And one more thing, and you know what? I don't think that's that bad. Mm. I don't think that's that bad. First of all, let's be deterministic. Like, it's happening, <laughs> right? You're if right. we want it or not. And I think ultimately what's really going to impact is where people go. People will go where they want to be. And the reality is that with all of the dissatisfaction on the economic and business model of applications like Instagram and TikTok and Facebook and Snapchat, majority of the world still happily interact in those platforms and those tools. So I don't see um, global billion people riots against what's happening. Which makes me believe that the the next wave of the internet will have a lot of similarities to the to the current uh, era of the internet, just in a different modality that is 3D with many more opportunities for creators. Because I think some of these platforms are definitely democratizing the power of creation and creating wealth and generating income. But I think there is going to still be a lot of similarities with how the current era of the internet is established until we really reach some fundamental breakthrough in technology, policy, regulation, where potentially things like blockchain and crypto or something else that we haven't even thought about yet that enables a more user-owned internet to come to life. So yeah, so this actually, you just literally just hit even harder on the point that I was going to make uh, now or the question I wanted to pose to you, which is, um, you know, the first version of the internet or, you know, internet 1.0, if you will, or web one was a very decentralized place. Uh, it, it, you know, it was a very utopian uh, vision for the internet and, you know, against all odds, um, it came to be, right? It's this open web and it's an open protocol and it's anybody can build on it. And, you know, web one was was kind of the, almost the democratic vision of what we're now talking about for the metaverse came to be. Web two, in some people's opinion, is a big step backwards because it's a much more centralized version of the internet that's got, got gatekeepers like Apple and Google and Facebook and, you know, these huge companies um, that essentially own the customer, own the user experience. And it's a much more centralized versus decentralized vision of the internet or, or experience of the internet for the, certainly for the end consumer. And my question to you is, you know, as we talk about Web3 and some of the principles that underlie that, which is, hey, let's go back to this more decentralized vision for, you know, user ownership. Let's go back to this less corporate controlled version of the Internet. Let's build a metaverse that's for the people, by the people. Um, is that, again, realistic um, in a world where, you know, when Web1 came to be, that 
it wasn't really possible to build, you know, we didn't have these gatekeepers, right? There wasn't really possible for these big corporations to control the experience overall. AOL tried, and as we just, you know, found, failed, right? And there were others in that in that same vein. Um, can there be a version of the metaverse that is Web3 enabled? And maybe this is the question I ask of you here is, what does Web3 mean to you? How fundamental is Web3? And by Web3, I mean, you know, this decentralized idea that, you know, there is no longer a corporate, you know, a gatekeeper for, for these experiences. How realistic is that? Is there a blockchain enabled version of the metaverse that actually is possible versus these individual islands of metaverses that we just talked about, which again, I, I agree with you. I don't think there's anything wrong with Facebook building their version and Second Life still, you know, being around and Roblox doing their, like, there's nothing wrong with those experiences. Like if consumers like them, like, great. <laughs> like that's what, that's what, you know, a, a choice is all about, you know, and, and capitalism is the best version of capitalism, arguably, is one where there's lots of different versions of something that different people enjoy for different reasons. But if we are talking about this, this this uber metaverse does it need web3 does it need decentralization does it need blockchain technologies and crypto in order to enable it yeah look i think it's a great question i, I would say <clears throat> the one thing that is important to highlight though that in 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 web2 right in the era of social media let's say the last 15 20 years what these companies have done like instagram like especially facebook let's say the big ones facebook google amazon what they've done is really they took that decentralized internet of Web1 and they created applications that made it very simple for people to adopt the internet. Amazon with e-commerce, Facebook with creating, you know, upload messages and videos and share it with your friends and build a social network. Google, of course, you know, with search and, and later on other companies that have built jaggernauts on, on top of mobile and cloud technologies. And, and I think what these companies have done <clears throat> they really created a seamless way of for people to adopt the internet, first on desktop, then on mobile. And that was fundamental. And with that came the power of owning a, a pretty big population of users. And then because the main business model of the internet in, the current fun, in its current form is either e-commerce transaction or advertising, that's what we get. We are the product. We are being monetized. Our eyeballs, our attention is being monetized. Now, do I want that to continue to be the case? No, I, I don't. However, I am struggling to see how financialization of the entire internet is the solution. I think we have a very difficult use case of dealing with money is a sensitive thing. And I understand that there's a lot of reasoning behind why people would want to have a Web3 wallet and everything will be cryptographically en enabled and so on and so forth. I just don't think we have seen yet the use cases and TB TBD when those use cases will arrive where you can say, wow, it's going to be incredibly simple for people to do that and to understand why they need that where we're still trying to onboard another half uh, of the world population into mobile and using e-commerce and, and purchasing something with a credit card. Um, now, maybe these populations would leapfrog, et cetera, et cetera. But going back to the question you finished with, which is, do we need blockchain for a metaverse? Um, I, no, I don't see how blockchain in and of itself is a technology that is critical for the metaverse. And here is the reason why. A lot of the proponents of blockchain want to use blockchain because it's the answer to all the internet landlords who are closing the internet, who want to build an internet that is proprietary, right? And everyone is skeptic about what Facebook want to do with Meta, uh, what Meta want to do with, with, with MetaQuest and Horizon and so on and so forth. I'm saying something different. I'm saying it doesn't have to be this way because what if these companies can collaborate? What if these companies can actually come up and design protocols that enable what something like blockchain, and they may or may not want to use something like blockchain as the underlining technology with all of, the, all of its advantages and all of its disadvantages of a peer-to-peer -peer network and the lack of scalability of that. And I think that's part of the issue we're having now <clears throat> looking at layer one blockchains and how unscalable it is in terms of cost. I mean, just look at the NFT use case. You need to buy an NFT. It costs you 10 times more than the NFT to actually pay the gas fees. Now go convince 5 billion people that actually paying gas fees makes sense. No, it doesn't actually. That, let alone 5 billion, even for 1 million people, it doesn't make sense. So I think blockchain, cryptocurrencies, Web3 as the umbrella term for those technologies, 
I think it's very, very nascent. And I don't know if I have enough expertise and understanding of those technologies at the moment to say how big of a role it's going to play. I, I do believe, though, that over time, either these companies, the leading companies or new companies, will need to build platforms that incentivizes, in a much more scalable way, creators and users, either because there is a bigger piece of ownership or because there is a way where users can also monetize assets that they own. But again, is blockchain absolutely is a prerequisite for that to, to happen? I, 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 don't, I don't think so. There's probably other solutions that we haven't thought about that could potentially enable that. And are it's, is it going to be those companies like Roblox, Epic, um, Facebook, et cetera? Maybe not. Maybe they're going to be completely new companies, which is why for me, I think it's important to focus on what is now and how do we take the now and do it better and think evolution rather than we got to break everything down. We got to create, it's all, it's, it's, it's madness. It doesn't work. Let's change, which is more of a revolution. I think a revolution was the internet, the World Wide Web, the beginning. I think now we have all of that. Now it's about, okay, how do we evolve from here to what's the next era of their internet looks like? And I am a big proponent of a user-owned internet where users have a bigger skin in the game of where they spend money and how can they monetize some of their assets should they want to, because I believe majority of the world is not going to buy and flip NFTs. That's not what people are going to do with their time. And I also don't believe that gaming is going to become, you know, a, a, a play to earn. You know, I remember a year, a year and a half ago when Axie Infinity, you know, rose, there were people who said, this is it. Not, I mean, within a few years, 90% of games are going to be play to earn. I think people now understand that at best, you know, this is something that very few people are going to want to do for income. At worst, it's a, it's a, it's a Ponzi scheme. And so I agree with the philosophy of, and I'm excited about what does a user-owned internet looks like? I just don't think we have the answer yet. And I also don't believe it's a prerequisite to enable a metaverse. Well, it's a very comprehensive answer. I'm going to push back on one thing that you, you mentioned there. So I'm going to take take back to something you said earlier, which I, I happen to believe in as well, which is you know a, a fully fledged version of the metaverse is one where you can take your digital assets from one place to the other. You, you the user, you own them. Um, you also just mentioned something about users monetizing their assets. We're going to talk about monetization in a second, separately uh, as a topic. Um, but you know, you the user, the consumer, owning your assets, being able to take them from one place to the other um, for a fully fledged version of the metaverse. It is, in my opinion, and I think your opinion, important. Um, I you know, heard you say that earlier. Uh, the reason I was pushing on Web3 and blockchain is because that is one of the use cases that blockchain does, in, at least in theory. Yes, gas fees. Yes, you know, scalability. These are all issues that can be, I think, overcome. And I'm not going to be the, the, the blockchain maxi here. <laughs> but but I, will, I will just push back on, on a point that you made, which is um, what would the alternatives be to something like a blockchain-enabled solution for users to take their digital assets from one place to the other, to actually have true ownership that isn't corporate controlled, isn't controlled by some gatekeeper. Um, I'm open to there being alternative technical solutions, but they all look something like a blockchain-enabled system, right? Maybe a better one. <laughs> I'm open to there being one of those out there. Um, but I, I, I struggle to imagine a world where if it's not a corporation, if it's not a centralized authority that, that controls this, you know, this movement of digital assets between one place and the other, well, it needs to be a decentralized one. And as of right now, maybe my imagination isn't strong enough, but as of right now, I struggle to imagine how you could do that uh, without something like a blockchain-powered solution. No, I, I, and I'm with you. I, it most likely, if a decentralized metaverse will emerge, whoever the company that is building it, if it's an existing company or company that is going to be born tomorrow, at the moment with what we're seeing, most likely blockchain will play a role. I mean, I, I'm totally there. I'm not against blockchain technology. Quite the opposite. It's an, it's an, it's, it's been an incredible technical innovation. There's no doubt about that. Um, and so. You know, crypto is 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 a slightly different conversation. Cryptocurrency, hundred percent agree. By the way, yeah, I, I when and I just want to say for our listeners, 
anytime anybody conflates crypto with blockchain, with Web3, with NFTs, with like, they're not the same thing. These are all different applications of an underlying set of technologies. And I get quite annoyed and quite upset when somebody tells me like, oh, it's all a scam. Like, no, like it's a set of technologies. You can use it or abuse it just like with any set of technologies. And that was the big innovation. That is still the biggest innovation right. since Bitcoin was launched, which is a decentralized network, uh, a payment network, a peer-to-peer, decentralized peer-to-peer payment network. The underlying tech, which is blockchain, that was the biggest innovation until today. There is nothing bigger than that that has been discovered over the last 12 years or 15 years. And in that respect, I do agree that at the moment, in order to enable a decentralized metaverse or a decentralized internet, most likely blockchain will have a role to play. I just don't think it's blockchain only. And also, I think it's a, it's the companies needs to decide how they are going to integrate blockchain and what blockchain, what role blockchain plays in enabling what they want to enable. But again, let's assume Roblox wants to enable something to do with decentralized um, network and they will use blockchain. Ultimately, they're going to have to be a collaboration. Where do, where do you go? <laughs> where do you take those assets with you when you go outside of Roblox? Which again, why to me, it's not just about one company. All companies are going to have to work on shared protocols in order to enable a true open metaverse because it can't just be one. If it's just one, then they shouldn't do it. And then everyone just stays closed, which is why I'm saying, I think ultimately the companies that I believe will make the step forward are the companies that understand where the world is going, where users want to be, which may, again, may need one or two more generations of consumers and users in order to, like, look at all the backlash at the moment that we're seeing from even young people when it comes to things like blockchain and, and NFTs and so on and so forth. And so I, I, I think we're really at the, here's kind of the, the thing. I think we're really at the beginning of the beginning of the metaverse emerging and what it actually is for consumers, for businesses, for brands, for enterprises. And then there's the whole other layer of what does a decentralized metaverse looks like, right? So there's two things that are happening at the same time, which we're talking about, Nico. One is the evolution or the transition of the internet from 2D to 3D. And then we have the other thing, which is the evolution of the internet from a centralized platform to a decentralized infrastructure. And those two things are happening in parallel and they may not take place at the same pace, But in an ideal world, in order for you to have access to a network of virtual worlds in 3D that are persistent, synchronous, and large scale, and where you can carry your identity and assets with you, those two things need to marry together. But again, for a metaverse to emerge in its purest form, you need that. But that doesn't mean you can have a collection of metaverse type platforms that are still probably not going to be bad, but they're not going to accomplish the bigger vision that we all have. Yeah, no, I, I I buy that. That's absolutely, and you know, I think the way you put it there, evolution of two D to three D, uh, in conjunction with evolution of centralized to decentralized. I think that concept, that's a tight way of putting it. So I'm gonna. If I'm you gonna wake me up that. in the middle of the night and ask me, these are the two things I I would probably keep in mind: two D to three D and centralized to decentralized. I mean, these are the two forces yeah. that are happening at the same time. Now, call it Web three, call it chain, doesn't matter. At the core of it, that's what it is. Yeah. No. No. And I actually. I believe in that and I see that as a, you know, I see it happening and I also see it as a vision that's worthy of pursuing. Okay, so let's change tack a little bit here. Uh, we talked about um, uh, monetization. You mentioned that as well. Um, you know, the notion of users monetizing their assets uh, in the metaverse, you know, because it's a more decentralized place, you, the user, you, the consumer own your assets and you can take them where you want and that with that comes, hey, well, you can sell them if you want to, you can transfer them, you can gift them, you can, you know, if it's blockchain enabled, you can burn them off the blockchain or whatever. Um, and then there's, of course, the notion of monetizing the, the company, uh, or if it's not a company, if it's a the fully fledged version of the metaverse where there is no company, you know, it's a decentralized version um, that that we've actually realized this this amazing end goal that we're we're talking about. Um, Talk to me about making money, you know, like that's ultimately what we're talking about here. Uh, who is making money in the metaverse? How are they making money in the, in the metaverse? Uh, what is the healthiest version of an ecosystem where money and, you know, transfers of financial value are happening? Um, ultimately, all of human society has always been driven by, you know, these transfers of value, whether it's bartering from back in the day to now, you know, 
very complex, you know, global financial systems, you know, money makes the world go round. That's what it is, you know, money, money, money. And the metaverse, I don't think is going to be any different. That has been a human driver from the very beginning. So as, uh, as utopian as, as we want to be about this end state of a truly decentralized user owned user controlled, uh, metaverse is how do you actually make money in that world as, as grubby as it sounds, what does that look like in your mind and who, who benefits the most in the metaverse, uh, from transfers of economic value? Yeah. It's a loaded question. Uh, a little bit. So maybe, maybe let me answer this in two ways. One is what could happen and what might, what might, what most likely will happen, <laughs> right? What, what might happen is that we are creating a really decentralized marketplace where everyone makes money. Protocol layer makes money because people are building on these different protocols. Infrastructure companies are making money like NVIDIA because it's built on core technology. Creators make money. Platforms make money. Creators who create the content platform, platform will, you know, basically enable those enclaves of virtual worlds. Um, users and consumers make money because it's a free marketplace, just like in real life. You know, today you can go and you can sell, you can buy. Imagine hap that happens with billions of people in one gigantic virtual marketplace around the world. Again, excluding China, uh, still pretty large, right? And so that's what might happen. What might happen is that the internet is, is so fragmented that these network of virtual world, the, the, the 3D internet, is really built in a way where everyone can, everyone has a skin in the game. I think most likely what will happen is that leading companies will always find and seek the way to make more money. And even when they portray what type of changes need to happen in the marketplace. Like for example, what Epic Games has, has been proposing for quite a while now where they want to lower the barrier for creation and increase the amount of money that creators want to make, but they're coming to it from the angle of expanding the pool, creating a bigger total addressable market. So this is not uh, uh, altruism. This is just smart business <clears throat> thinking on what the ecosystem should look like so everyone can make more money. And I think that's what most likely will happen. I think we're going to still have companies who are techno who, who make money on techno on selling technology, like NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a technology company in its purest form. NVIDIA makes money by selling you technology that you use to build stuff. Then you use that stuff to build tools, applications, protocols, platforms. Right, And then you make money by building these platforms. Either you also have protocols or environments and creators are coming in to build on those places. Let's think about the, wide, the World Wide Web, the wider internet. And creators come in to make money. I think the biggest question is going to be who makes money and how much money they make. What is the distribution of proceeds from the economic activity that is happening in the metaverse? That is the biggest question. Today, it's very, very, very centralized. Right? The platforms make majority of the money. Creators barely make money. I mean, on Roblox, it's, 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 it's about you know, 30%, 70% of every dollar spent in a game on Roblox goes to the developer, 30% goes to Roblox. But Roblox also needs to pay the App Store 30%. And then if you think about Fortnite Creative, you only make 5% if you sell some skin inside Fortnite Creative. And then Fortnite needs to pay the 30% to Apple as well. Right? So there is this entirely convoluted paradigm of who makes money and how much. And I think we're at a very fixated place at the moment where nothing really been changed or innovated in terms of the business model. That 70, 30, 80, 20 is pretty much the, the norm at the moment, thanks to Apple, right? Like it or hate it. So I think we're going to have to see some business model innovation in order to enable the ecosystem to make money beyond what's available now. And I think this is where the biggest opportunity in my mind, which is creators and democratizing who can build and how much money they can make, I think that's a very powerful trend that is happening. And we're very at the very nascent stage of the contribution of creators and developers into what the metaverse can become. And I think the platforms that enable 
creators and developers to really build businesses and wealth are going to be the platform where the best developers, the most talented creators come to build. And that's to me, is going to be the first wave of innovation. And I don't know who is going to be that player. I think Roblox is obviously a category leader when you think about virtual world building at the moment. This may well change in the next three, five, seven years. Yeah, this actually very nicely comes into the next question I was going to ask you anyway. Um, you know, there's, there's a, always a classic chicken egg situation, um, you know, when you're building a platform and you're trying to attract developers. Um, you know, content is king, as they say. And there's really no reason for anybody to go into a virtual world, a metaverse, whatever you want to call it. Um, unless there's a reason to be there. Either all your friends are there, in which case you've got that kind of social network effect going, um, or there's great content that you want to engage with. Um, you know, Roblox obviously has done, a, in my opinion, a very good job of this. Are they the best in the business? Probably, um, or at least one of the best. Uh, you know, they've made an environment, and you keep alluding to it, and of course you're building on Roblox. Um, so, uh, you know, they've done a really nice job of bringing, uh, creating incentives that bring in developers and users at the same time and creating that virtuous flywheel. Now, it hasn't come overnight. Obviously, Roblox is a lot older as a company than most people realize. Um, but uh, they have, they've got there and they're doing what they can to kind of incentivize developers to create these great experiences, which then keeps the players and the, the consumers in there, creates new relationships, and that's your virtuous flywheel. Um, you know, Meta is coming at it with this brute force approach. Um, you know, Zuckerberg is, is, is hell-bent on creating the metaverse, um, and he's spending billions and billions of dollars on doing so. But by all accounts, at least so far... It's a bit of a, you know, tumbleweed, you know, <laughs> floating by. There aren't great experiences. Therefore, there aren't great, uh, you know, there aren't that many users. You know, therefore, there aren't developers who want to create. And so you've got the negative version of the, the flywheel. So my question to you here is, as these metaverses or me the metaverse ultimately gets built, what role does content, games watching a movie together in the metaverse. Like you can imagine lots of different experiences. Obviously, you know, content and games is kind of where we come from, you, you and I, but you can imagine a world, uh, many worlds, in fact, <laughs> virtual worlds, where you are consuming all kinds of content. Um, and that's the reason you're coming and then you're forming relationships and that's keeping it sticky. Uh, I'm very, very curious how critical you think content, gaming, other interactive entertainment is to a successful version of the metaverse and and the ultimate vision of course for that you know holistic unified world that we, we yeah share. i have um here's my point of view i think the metaverse is fundamentally going to be a generational thing what do i mean by that if you're under 25 year old today you don't need to think about the metaverse. You're already living in the metaverse for the past 10 years of your life because mostly you, most likely you've been on Roblox or Minecraft or a combination of both. And that means you're already experienced what it's like to live in the internet as a 3D avatar and making friends as a 3D avatar. This is going to be the first generation, I, anyone below age 25, that is going to be shaping what the metaverse become and what's important for them. Today, and I think for the next three, five, maybe seven years, this means the metaverse will continue to be largely focused on interactive entertainment and games. And, and that's what I suspect is going to be the short term. As that generation grows and matures, because they've grew up as avatars and living in these virtual spaces, this is going to be the first generation where there's going to be an opportunity to create completely new things that you and I, for us, it's going to be totally foreign. What does e-commerce looks like in 3D in the metaverse? It probably doesn't necessarily look like what it looks today. How much of an interactive activity and fun and play and games needs to be included? We don't know. And so to me, the next few years are still largely going to be focused on interactive entertainment and gamified experiences. It will still feel and look like, quote unquote, a video game meets social media in 3D. E-commerce will come in in the next few years as well. So it's going to be that sort of, you know, Video games, social media, e-commerce, that will be the triangle. And it would all still feel like a video game, I believe, in the next five years, maybe more. The big leap forward is going to be when there is a, a big population of this metaverse generation that is now 30, 35, 40, which will happen over the next you know, 10, 15 years. And then what is that experience, these experiences that looks like when they reach that age, when they're no longer kids, they're now grown-ups and adults and they work. And I think that, think about that. 
That's why I think of the metaverse as a generational shift. It's the first generation that is going to be living in an internet in 3D. And what they're going to want is not what you and I have in mind at the moment. And so that's why in the short term, I believe it still will look and feel like a video game. What it looks beyond that, this is exactly why I started Super Social. So we can figure that out and, and imagine what, that, what does it look like to live in a, in a 3D internet. But it will be built on, on the insight of understanding that generation because they're the first one who grew up as a 3D avatar, made friends as a 3D avatar, and are building businesses as a 3D avatar. I mean, if you look at Roblox creators, among themselves, they don't call each other in, in their real names. They talk to each other in their Roblox username. That tells you that this, this is the first generation that lives in this virtual world like reality. And that's why I think it's still going to take time, which is exciting. So I, I know we're running low on time, but I just want to throw one quick uh, thought out there. You know, Second Life, Second Life obviously has been around for a very long time, longer than Roblox and, um, and Minecraft. Uh, 2003, I believe, is when they, they got started. So we're talking literally 20 years, two decades. Um, what role do you think Second Life has played in this? You know, wouldn't you argue that se- the, the folks who came through in Second Life are actually the first generation that have lived through this metaverse experience? You know, why, why, in your view, do you think Roblox and Minecraft are actually the catalyst that's going to kick off this next wave, this generational wave of enthusiasm and, um, you, you know, this lived experience of being a virtual avatar in a, in a 3D world when Second Life has arguably been doing it for, for two decades. What's well, first, different? I think Second Life was an MVP. It was a great MVP. Fair enough. A really successful MVP. But I think it was an MVP. One more thing is that Second Life was not used most people who have been on Second Life are not kids. So their identity wasn't shaped as kids. We're talking now about Mm -hmm. a generation that since age eight, they are interacting mostly as 3D avatars. That is fundamental. That didn't happen in Second Life. Most people at that age didn't even have access to the internet. And Second Life started at the beginning of the internet. There are a very small group of users on the internet. Now it's billions. And now you can access Roblox. 75% of the 60 million daily active users on Roblox access Roblox on mobile and tablets. That was unimaginable 20 years ago. The scale of exposure to virtual worlds completely changed, way, way bigger around the world. It's at a much higher quality. So you can access these virtual worlds wherever you want, anytime, and whoever you are. So I think we're looking at a whole different scale and we're looking at worlds where today six, seven-year-olds are already getting into Roblox. So their DNA and their identity is shaped very much in 3D avatar mode as much as in reality, in, form, in physical form factor. That's a, quite a paradigm shift in my mind. Yeah, that's, and that's a great answer. I mean, I have two kids, they're 11 and 9, and they, they live in Minecraft. Yeah, you ask them, hey, what is the metaverse? Um, are you in the metaverse? They're like, no, I'm on Roblox. They don't need to explain to us the metaverse. Yeah, they are in it. It's just us, everyone above yeah. 30, who needs to explain what is the metaverse. By the time the rest of the world understand what the metaverse is, you're going to have a couple of billion people who grew up on the metaverse, and for them, that's reality. That's the paradigm shift I'm talking about. That's what got me excited about starting Super Social in 2020, realizing that this is what's happening over the next 10 years, 10, 15 years. Well, that is actually a perfect place to end this. Um, what a thought. Uh, I'm excited. One metaverse. Uh, hopefully we've answered that to at least some degree. Um, Jan, it's been a real pleasure to have you on. Your energy, your enthusiasm, your uh, insights, uh, incredible. Um, and so hopefully our listeners found that too. Thank you so much for coming on the pod. Really appreciate it. Thank your time. you. No, great question. and really appreciate inviting me here. And I also want to say a big thank you to all of our listeners. We will not be having an episode next week, thanks to the holiday break. So in the meantime, feel free to gorge on the Metacast back catalog, uh, spend time with family and friends, and of course, eat and drink more than you know you ought to. Uh, We'll be back the first week of January with more interviews, more insights, and more analysis from the weird and wonderful world of Web3. Until next time, friends, stay crypto curious and feel free to send me questions, guest recommendations, and comments. My email is nico at novic.co, and you can find me on Twitter at nicothefin. DMs always open. Thanks again. Bye.